Welcome and thank you for joining us for another segment of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm very excited today because uh, today we're going to be talking about growing in substrate. And uh, to me, I think this is a, a pretty fairly new practice. And uh, what's important about it to me is we're seeing a lot of growers shifting what they're doing uh, and moving to uh, this, uh, this new process. And uh, more importantly, what we're going to learn about it today is uh, why people are doing it, how they're doing it, and what benefit it brings to their operations uh, when they do this. And so all very uh, positive uh, conversation here. And leading us through this conversation today is uh, Cassie Tovez. Uh, and for those of you who uh, know Cassie, you know what uh, what a uh, inspiration uh, she's been to a lot of people getting into the uh, irrigation business. What I say is uh, she's part of that new generation, uh, a younger generation that is uh, embracing technology and new processes and uh, helping move agriculture forward. Uh, you know, she graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a degree in uh, agriculture system management, uh, go Mustangs. And uh, you know she's been very active in uh, processes and design uh, for irrigation. Uh, it's a it's a great combination of study. Uh, if you talk to anybody in the in the Central Valley and Central Coast, uh, they know Cassie. They know she's an expert in the field, and they really appreciate the uh, the advice and wisdom she provides them when talking about uh, irrigation and agriculture. So, uh, Cassie, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So um, we're, oh gosh, middle of June already. I can hardly believe it. This year is just flying by. Uh, how has the season been so far uh, with the growers you're working with? No, I mean, we've, we've stayed really busy. I feel like all the growers are staying busy, obviously, with this whole coronavirus thing. We had a little bit of kind of volatility and unknown of what was happening. Now, really, it's just kind of the supply chain issues people are having. But you know, everybody's been staying, I, I would say, busy as usual, just wishing we would have got a little bit more rain. Of, so, yeah. So is everybody talking about the water situation right now? Yeah, I've got a, a couple growers. I mean, here on the coast, we're lucky. We have, you know, pretty good water source coming out of groundwater already. Um, but a lot of my growers over in the Central Valley, Valley are really struggling right now on being able to figure out, you know, where they're going to be able to get water from or how they're trying to kind of meet all of their needs out in the field, because there's just not a lot of availability for pumping right now. Yeah, it's interesting when I see the numbers like uh, they're going to be supplied with 5%. You know, the first thing you think about is a 5% reduction and no, they mean 5% of the total. Yeah. <laughs> you know, very, very little water. And, and some I know have been told uh, they're, they're going to get none. So uh, yeah, kind of an interesting situation now. Uh, today we're talking about substrate farming. And um, uh, I'm just curious as to what substrate farming is. And more importantly, does it save any water? Yeah, so... The, the good answer is yes and no. Um, a plant needs a certain amount of water no matter how it grows, but it's how effectively and efficiently we can get it that water so that we're not wasting anything. So short answer of what is substrate farming is uh, typically growing in anything besides soil media. So um, kind of most common ones you would see are a rock wool or cocoa core blend, and they either put those into a, a, a potted plant type application or into a trough or gutter. Um, the next option you see is almost kind of like a foam material, if you haven't seen it before, that the plants get planted into. And they're kind of like a plastic wrapped cube or bag. Um, and then you could go as far as to say, you know, hydroponics and aeroponics are, you know, would be considered kind of a substrate growing because it's not your conventional type of soil grown plant. How interesting. So the, uh, the, um, the, the substrate that we see, I think this is maybe in your middle picture. Uh, is this like what you see like when you get uh, flowers from a uh, florist or something like that? Would that, is it the same type of material? It's, it's kind of the best way you could describe it. It's a little less kind of styrofoamy feeling than that. Um, a little bit more organic feeling, um, but it is very kind of similar for lack of a better correlation. That's kind of what I would tell most people. It's kind of like that. Yeah. So what, um, so what, you know, you say anything that is not soil, uh, we're growing in substrate. What are some of the popular uh, substrates uh, people are growing in right now? Um, for crops or for the actual media itself? Uh, for the actual media itself. So typically I would say the, ma the majority of stuff that we see is either this um, kind of 
grow dan that's the, that's the brand that's there that kind of foam type material or a, a mixture of cocoa core and peat moss and then depending on which manufacturer you're getting that from you can kind of pick your own blend ratio and those are kind of the two big ones that you would see for right now yeah so and and what makes those popular is just just been success or um, um or, or is this just kind of the best available option i think it's just kind of you, you know the United States is kind of behind, I would say, in substrate when it comes to it. A lot of other countries have been doing this for a long time. So I think a lot of what we're using is just kind of trickle down from what's worked in other areas. Um, and then obviously, depending on the specific plant, there's kind of different ratios you can make of those blends to be able to work for you best. But a lot of it's just, I think, kind of tried and true from prior industries. Huh. Interesting. So uh, I, I'm, I'm always um, fascinated by this and I want to remind people, I see we got a question coming in and the Q&A is open as well as the chat. And if you drop your questions or uh, uh, comments in there, I will, uh, I will get them to Cassie when it's appropriate. Um, so um, one of the questions that's coming up right now is, uh, can the substrate be reused after harvest? You know, could you get more than one, uh, one pass at this? Yes, so it really depends on the substrate and, and your kind of growing practices, but uh, let's say for strawberries grown on tabletops, mostly those are grown in a bag that's about a meter long and they put you know three or four plants within that meter. Um, they can actually remove that strawberry plant and replant into it. Um, and we've had some growers that have done that, you know, two, three turns be able to reuse those, but it is a labor intensive process. When you're using something that's more of an open trough that's filled with the media, it's a lot easier for you to be able to remove the plant, replace any media that you might have lost, and then keep going. So it can be reused. Um, so much on the kind of blocks, those typically we don't see get reused because the, the, the root intrusion just, it fills that whole thing up with roots. So it's really just kind of a one and done on those. Right. So, but if you had, uh, for instance, blueberries that uh, stay around for a few years, right, you're, you're good for the length of, uh, of that yeah. plant. Yep. So um, we have another question coming in and it's, uh, it's asking when you say foam, what exactly is that? Uh, I don't know, is it a, uh, uh, a chemically made foam or, or do you have any idea on this? I know that different manufacturers all have different stuff that they use to make them. And there are quite a few different manufacturers of this stuff, but I think some of them are like perlite that's used in them to be made. Um, I don't know all the specifics of all of them because it's not something that we, we, we sell. So I don't haven't dove too deep into that market, but um, I know they all kind of have a different blend that they're using. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. So the thing that always confused me about this is uh, I always thought that, you know, when you're when you're growing, that you really, you know, you want to put your plants in soil, you want them to get deep roots, you want to have them, you know, plenty of uh, soil to uh, uh, grab their nutrients from. And so then this was kind of like a 180 spin on this, right? Spin it around. Now I want to go into a, a small container uh, yeah. that uh, my roots aren't going to get a lot of uh, penetration or get very deep. Uh, how does all this work? Who figured this out? I mean, I, I just don't understand. Yeah, I know. I mean, again, it's kind of been uh, happening in other areas for a long time. And I think a lot of it came down to um, just, you know, what was available, you know, if, if, the, if the soil wasn't compatible with that crop that you were trying to grow or different things that what else can we use? I think the one that baffles me the most is aeroponics, where you literally have the roots just open air and you're spraying them with a water fertilizer mix and the plants just continue to grow. Um, but I mean, really all, all a substrate really is, is just any media that's gonna allow for an organism to grow and uptake nutrients. So it doesn't have to be soil specifically, it's really anything that's gonna allow for that. So I would think that one of the issues people would face is that the roots might get too much exposure to air or sun or light, artificial light, uh, and, and that would cause damage. How, how do people get around that? Yeah, so in these cases, um, when you're in a pot, obviously the roots are growing down inside of that pot. So they're not going to get exposed to any UV or anything like that. But there is quite a bit of air that's allowed to circulate through those pots, typically because they're made because they want that air circulation. Um, in the bags, again, the bag itself just has a small hole where the plant is going into. So the roots are then contained inside the bag. And similar with these blocks, 
very common the outsides all wrap so the roots are still being drawn down towards the bottom of the block not up towards the surface where they're going to be damaged huh interesting and then the uh the troughs like the uh that the strawberries are growing in mm -hmm. the they always look like to me that they're just, uh, you know, rain gutters off houses, but uh, I, I think they're more than that. What, what, what are they? Honestly, they're, they're pretty similar. So the equipment that's used to make them is really similar. It shows up as a big flat roll of metal that they send through an extruding machine that then forms it into that gutter. And there's different shaped gutters, but virtually what we want is for the bag to be able to sit on there, any drainage to be able to get out from away from that bag into a different channel and then leave the table. So it's very similar to a gutter on your house, just a little bit different in the shape to be able to allow for that water flow out. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. So then, but now, you know, instead of being in uh, soil that I might have, uh, you know, 15 inch roots, I've got just a small area. Um, yeah. And, uh, it, you know, I might be watering every couple of days, you know, of course, depending on ET and what's happening, but uh, I might be watering every couple of days. Now I think with the substrate, I'm going to be watering more often. Is that right? Yeah. And I'll kind of jump ahead here a little bit. So um, that's one of the big things that you're going to have is the, the amount that you need to irrigate is going to change. So when you're irrigating, let's say out in the field, you have a huge soil capacity for these plants that you're growing. So you can irrigate maybe once every other day, once every three days, and fill that whole soil area with water that then the plants can draw from over the next couple of days for their water and nutrient needs. Now you're looking at this really small, tiny area with a small water holding capacity that we need to be able to fill. So now what you're looking at is where you need to be able to irrigate frequently and small pulse irrigations. So we want to give the plant exactly what it needs when it needs it. So that it can use it and then irrigate again. So going from maybe something that was, you know, every other day irrigation to now maybe 20 times per day that you're irrigating this plant. So it is a very different strategy for irrigation. So uh, how, how do I learn if it's 20 times a day, 10 times a day? Are these growers, you know, turning the irrigation on, watching to see when the soil uh, gets uh, full and then turning it off uh, and, and figuring it out over time? Are they using uh, soil moisture sensors? How, how are they figuring this out? Yeah, so some popular things that we use for irrigation just in general for distributing the water on these systems is you know, your standard plain tubing with a punch on emitter. Some people like using a stake assembly. Um, we're seeing a big push now to just an inline drip tubing um, so that the cost is a lot better on that and the labor for having to actually punch on the emitters is a big saving. So we're seeing a lot of people try to push towards that. Um, and then obviously some other automation things that are gonna come in there. When you need to irrigate 20 times a day, you do not want to hire somebody who's running around opening and closing valves all over your ranch all day long. So automation has become a really big thing when it comes to substrate growing. Um, it allows us to be able to automate the irrigations itself as well as tie into a lot of other data-driven collection. So with that, we're able to then uh, make better decisions. Oops, I think I went one too far for you. Um, you're allowed to, to make a lot better decisions on things. So some of the software that we have available through different platforms that we use for automation will allow for you to integrate soil moisture probes to see what the actual soil moisture is in a representative group of plants. Um, we even have systems that come down to weighing the plants to be able to tell you the actual water capacity in the pots. And then from that, we can calculate what the drainage is. So we can say, all right, at this point we got drain. We know that we're at you know, field capacity um, on those plants and then be able to allow a specific amount of dry back to allow those roots to dry out enough to be able to trigger the next irrigation. We can calculate your drain percentage off the ranch, what the EC values of are off of the drain water. So knowing if you're putting on enough fertilizers, if the plant is uptaking the fertilizer proper, properly, all of those things can now kind of be tied into this automation platform to allow this new decision-making process that might not be what you're used to more easy to manage. Yeah, how, how interesting, um, especially the weighing the plant. Uh, I, th I thought that was really uh, great. So uh, different technology, right? 
And right. uh, how, how easy is it for uh, growers to learn this technology? Is it, a, is it a struggle for them? Do they have lots of choices? Uh, how's all that work? Yeah, so the ag tech space has obviously been exploding for quite a few years now with a lot of players coming in, a lot of players also leaving every year. So it's a little bit volatile and making sure that you're partnering with the right um, product or the right manufacturer of those products when you do decide to go into automation because you're going to need support. It's not something you're just going to understand right off the bat. Um, just like I'm kind of the new era of agriculture here, we kind of see the same trend in the growers that there's a lot of a younger generation coming in. And that younger generation is, you know, more used to using technology, so they're more comfortable with it. When I approach some of my older growers, it is a struggle at first because it's a complete new learning curve for them. It's not what they're used to. And a lot of times that can be difficult. So I always say the biggest thing is don't go too much too fast. If you take it all on at one time, you're probably going to struggle and not be as happy as if you kind of do baby steps into it. Well, that's a real, that's really good advice. I, I like that. I, I almost apply that to anything we're doing, right? Um, yeah. Not getting that overwhelmed feeling while you're taking on something new. I, I like that. Um, and then, you know, one thing I wonder, is this a lot more costly? Does this add a lot more expense to my operation when I do this? Yes and no. So there's a lot of savings that you get going to substrate. Um, ground prep, for instance, having to, you know, rework the field between every crop cycle, um, fumigation, a lot of chemicals that we can't use anymore, the labor that all that takes, you have all that savings. However, there's a lot of infrastructure that typically goes into substrate. So now you're buying the media to grow in, the pots, um, potentially tables, if you're doing tabletop strawberries, if you're gonna be growing in a greenhouse, maybe you didn't have a greenhouse before. So there's a lot of infrastructure that's gonna go in um, as well as potentially a whole new irrigation system. And then you also have the automation side. So there's a lot of, I would say, upfront costs that you're going to hit, but there's savings long term. The other thing is the labor savings and potential savings of water and fertilizer. If we can utilize the water and fertilizer more efficiently, you're going to save money and save resources there, as well as with your labor. You're still going to need people in the field, but instead of having maybe 20 people, you can have 10 higher trained people to accomplish the same task. So there are some definite benefits that can come, but initially it's it's quite a big investment to make. That's so interesting because um, you know that the labor side is the most important, I think. And as we see wage pressure rising, I mean, we didn't have labor two years ago, three years ago, right? Everybody yeah. was talked about there was no labor. And uh, guess what? We don't have any more today, right? So, um, and, 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 and when you do find it, you have to pay them more. So if you can get that labor savings, I, I think, you know, some of those other other things aren't going to increase as sharply as what what I see labor going up. So, what a benefit yeah. there. Now, what about the 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 yields and what about the quality? Is it any better? I mean, it's really going to come down to a good grower. I mean, I've seen good growers on a flood irrigation system who can just kill it, but that takes a lot of experience and a lot of time to be that good of a grower. Um, so there's a lot more ability to do your job better. We have seen typically that there are higher yields in a lot of these areas. Um, one, because potentially you're going in a greenhouse versus outdoors. You have a better control on outside resources that you can't typically control. So you're going to have better yields because you're making that environment. Um, if you're still growing outside, let's say strawberries and raspberries and substrate, um, we've seen that there's just a better ability to manage the crop. So you're able to really drive the fruit production and drive different factors a lot easier than when you're trying to grow in the soil. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. So um, you know, I, I know you're a contributor to Irrigation uh, uh, Magazine also, Irrigation Today Magazine. And uh, I think you just recently wrote a uh, article about substrate farming, right? Right. And so it uh, seems like uh, the reception of this was very high. Uh, it seems like more and more people are getting interested. Do you have any sense of how many growers are switching uh, or, 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 or changing to uh, substrate farming? I know in the berry market, there's uh, quite a big push. Strawberries are a little bit slower just because the infrastructure costs are very high. Um, but there's a really big push for people to get changing. And a lot of um, 
you know, larger packers and different things are really pushing this to their growers as well, that this is where they want the future to head for the berry market. Um, the other big thing we've seen is indoor vertical farming. So, you know, craft lettuces and herbs and different things like that, that they're growing now fully robotically indoors um, with virtually, you know, very limited human interaction. And we see that that's a trend that's probably going to continue, especially in the really urban areas, that now they can use abandoned warehouses and turn those into farms, right? Yeah, I saw one a few uh, few months ago now uh, in Orange County, California. Uh, they were growing microgreens in a warehouse and the uh, what they grew it in, you know, they basically put a cover on and delivered that to the restaurant. And uh, yeah. my gosh, the uh, flavors that you got out of those microgreens were unbelievable and talk about a slick, fast process. Uh, uh, yeah, just I had great. a wasabi arugula and that was probably my favorite so far. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's great. So uh, we had another question here uh, from from a viewer, and I think I saw a slide on it earlier. Uh, what what is all being grown right now in in substrate? Yeah, I can go uh, crop back. wise. Um, these are just some kind of common ones right now: um, tomatoes, cucumbers, peas. Those have been grown for quite a while, typically all in um, greenhouse, but all in substrate there. Strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, all your cane berries are really transitioning into substrate. Um, cannabis is another big one currently. And then lettuce, herbs, the list can go on and on, but those are the kind of main ones that we've seen so far. I mean, I just toured a facility not too long ago, they were growing corn and substrate. So obviously that's not gonna make a, a long-term So that's, uh, that. yeah. Uh... Corn and substrate, that's an interesting um, uh, concept. Uh, I think we're having a little bit of block on our, uh, on our internet feed right now from Cassie, but um, I think she'll be back here in a second. Um, one thing as I look at this list and uh, I wanna ask her about in a moment when she is back uh, is uh, the cannabis. You know, it seems to me that the cannabis production got bigger uh, and as the cannabis production grew, amount of uh, areas growing cannabis indoors, it seemed like the other things caught on. So I was just wondering if um, if the hey you're back. <laughs> so I was just wondering, thinking about that slide, if uh, if cannabis led indoor growing, right? It seems like there's more people growing in substrate and indoors than before cannabis started to get popular a few years ago. Uh, do, you, do you have any feeling on that? Yeah, I mean. Um... Cannabis has definitely, I would say, caused um, some kind of leads in the market. I was trying to get my uh, screen back up here. Um, but cannabis becoming legalized, I mean, cannabis has been, been growing indoor, you know, pretty much primarily. Um, and they have actually caused a lot of other crops, I think, to see that as an opportunity. So I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a bad thing. I think that they've actually kind of opened the door up to a lot of other growers saying that, like, hey, there's this opportunity for us to be able to grow a lot of other crops potentially in these environments and be able to do that more efficiently. Yeah, I think you're right there. And I think um, uh, it was maybe three, four years ago when we were at Western Growers and uh, the different educational uh, events they were having. Um, when it came to the cannabis afternoon, uh, what's happening there, kind of an update. Um, I mean, it was a packed house, standing room only. You know, everybody wanted to learn about this uh, indoor growing and not necessarily that they wanted to be cannabis growers, but they wanted to know what was happening uh, in uh, the cannabis arena and uh, what the potential growth was, right? Because it was taking a lot of labor away too. So uh, uh, this is all having a big impact on, on traditional agriculture, that's for sure. Yeah, the one thing I would say for some of it that's a negative is that um, there's a lot more regulations on cannabis, obviously, and being able to regulate cannabis now has allowed those companies to be able to realize, hey, we can put these same regulations now onto our strawberry growers and our raspberry growers. So there has been that negative effect where, and that was part of their worries, I know, at Western Growers was what regulations on you are now going to be pushed over to us because they realized that they can do it. Yeah. Huh, I hadn't even thought about that. That's a really good point. So we actually have two people asking uh, kind of the same question. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's has growing in substrate and I'm guessing uh, almost all of this is in a, a greenhouse or in tunnels. Is that right? Yeah, typically. 
And so has this allowed people to grow year round or people in the northern parts of the US to grow uh, longer uh, as a result of doing this? Yeah, so for the berry market specifically, there's been some advantages of being able to get off cycle production um, because the plants are movable. They can, you know, kind of do some special things um, on tricking the plants into thinking it's a different time of the year before they bring them out to the field. So they can get off cycle production, which has been helpful. And then obviously when you're growing in a greenhouse or an indoor space, you really have a lot more ability to create your own climate. So that allows you to be able to grow virtually all year round because you're able to adjust that climate by obviously controls. Yeah, uh, so that's interesting. And then I, I was just going to mention, you know, the northern latitudes, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was noticing how many uh, hits our website, our Jane website was getting from the uh, uh, Michigan area. And uh, then I happened to get a call from somebody in Michigan, and, and they were there on business. I said, what are you doing there? They said, well, all the where all the auto warehouses are being converted to cannabis grow houses. Um, and it's a good good use of the uh, the warehouses, and because they control the climate, um, they can grow just about anywhere. And I thought, yeah. yeah, that was that was really interesting. Yeah, we've seen a lot of uh, very industrial type areas that now that cannabis has been legalized, a lot of that those old warehouses are being converted to that, or somebody trying to come in and convert it for you know indoor uh, lettuce and things like that. Yeah. So um, you did a great job of touching on the water and how we figure out how much to water. Um, the next thing I wonder about is uh, how do I know how much fertilizer to apply? <laughs> Again, that's really going to come back to the grower and, and the fertilizers that you're using and the plants that you're growing. Um, but our biggest thing is being able to get the data from that to adjust your fertilizer. So you're already going to know what your, your fertilizer regime is going to be. Um, obviously, before, maybe you fertigated once a week, right? You put it on with one of your irrigations where now you have the ability to, to fertigate with every irrigation. So you're gonna do a, a lower volume spoon feeding the plant. Um, however, now that we can get this data, you know, salinities from the actual soil media, as well as what the EC, um, what the EC is leaving the drain water, you can be able to make adjustments better to see maybe the plant's just not uptaking the fertilizer and we need to look at something like higher oxygen levels or maybe I'm over fertilizing and they just can't take it up and it's just being wasteful at that point. So uh, uh, drain water, right? I'd, uh, I, I have to talk about that too. Um, uh, so uh, the drain water, is it reused? So they recycle it? It is going that way. Again, back to those regulations. Um, when you irrigate into the soil, the water goes down and people tend not to worry about it. Obviously there's concerns about nitrate leaching and certain um, you know, reporting that growers need to do to make sure that they're not leaching too many nitrates into the groundwater, but it's not invisible. As soon as you bring all these plants out of the ground, put them on mulch plastic and water starts running off of your ranch, people notice it. <laughs> um, so what we're doing is actually typically collecting all of that drain water currently. And in most cases, either sending it through some sort of treatment system where we can remove the nitrates for it before we release it back into you know, the ditch runoff or wherever it would go. So we're not putting all those nitrates back out um, or we're trying to reuse it. So more and more of these systems, what we're doing is collecting that drain water, which is now you know, nutrient rich, treating it with UV or some other sort of disinfection to be able to kill any bacteria that are growing and then blending that water back in with your clean well water at some sort of rate. So you have a, a pre-EC coming in and re being able to reuse those nutrients. And that again is not only a nutrient saving, but also water savings there. I'll tell you, it's always very exciting to hear about these new processes, new ideas. It's very hopeful and uh, it, it's great to see uh, technology helping uh, solve a lot of the issues that uh, agriculture and all of us have, right? Because we all need the food from ag. So th th this is yeah. great to say, uh, great to see. Um, so we, uh, um, so we're, we're capturing some of it and, uh, and, uh, and, and cleaning it up um, and, and, and this is great. 
Um, I'm also wondering uh, what ways, what popular ways people are irrigating, right? I've seen, I've seen as uh, basic as running a mitter line from pot to pot and putting one emitter over each pot, right? Uh, very, it works and it, it's basic to, uh, uh, you know, octobubblers to four-way manifolds. Uh, what, what are you seeing and what are some of your favorite ways? Yeah, so typically, you know, back to the tried and true emitter line with a, a punch on button style emitter is kind of the go to um, and then using those manifolds, depending on the pot size to be able to really specifically position that water in the pot for optimum root growth. Um, there's a lot of cost associated with that, though, you know, the materials alone and the labor that goes into that. So we are seeing a lot of growers, if possible, trying to use uh, an emitter line that already has the or a tubing that already has the emitter built into it. So then they're able to get the spacings proper where they can position that emitter directly over the plant and be able to irrigate that way. And then obviously for indoor, there's a variety of different ways. You have customers that are flooding benches. We have, you know, spray apparatuses, floating rafts. You know, there's a, a lot of different fun stuff there. Yeah, so everybody has their own secret sauce, right? Their yeah. own uh, special way of doing it that works better than the next guy, right? Yeah. And, and what I've found, and I wonder if you've found this too, uh, it seems like this group seems to be more interested in irrigation or how to water and how much than, uh, than maybe uh, I saw traditionally. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like everybody knows plants need water and fertilizer to grow, but it was just kind of a, we know how to do it. We just do the same thing we've always done. And now there's this change of people are actually really interested in it and wanting to understand what they're buying and what options there are and what different things they can do. So it's kind of exciting because it's opening up their eyes to kind of the options available and what what stuff we really have. Yeah, and I think that's exactly why, right? And I, I'm not being disrespectful to the traditional farmer, but if you're somebody who just did flood irrigation, uh, you know, there's not that much to talk about. Uh, yeah. There's not that many uh, uh, tools to use in that where with the indoor growers or the substrate growers, uh, they tend to have a lot more tools and they want to talk about it and learn and, and, uh, and discuss ways that uh, they, they can use those. Definitely. So, um, so you've got your benefits slide up and, uh, and I'm wondering, uh, are there any additional benefits to growing in substrate that we haven't touched on already? Um, we, we kind of touched on the, the soil quality. So now you're able to potentially grow plants in an area where you might not have before just because of the poor soil quality. Another one that I see that's a really big benefit is the soil is never the same across 50 acres, let's say. It's gonna vary throughout the whole depth of the soil as well as different areas. And it's hard to manage that when you're trying to, to irrigate and all of a sudden you have an area that's super sandy versus super clay. So, um... Looks like we're having a little bit of a internet feed issue again, um, and uh, so if you can uh, if you can hear me, I just want to say that we do have another question about watermelon. Somebody's saying they really like watermelons, including myself. When Michael Pippin said last week, "There's nothing better than slicing a watermelon open in the field and and eating it there," I I, I can just imagine how great that must be. be. So uh, uh, that's one of the questions we'd want to get to. Uh, but um, it looks like we might not get um, Cassie back. Fortunately, we are at the uh, uh, end of the segment. Uh, I want to say thank you to all our viewers for joining us today. I also want to say thank you to Cassie. She did a really great job uh, of explaining uh, some of the basics, uh, the beginning basics of uh, uh, growing in substrate. And we very much appreciate that, Cassie. I was just uh, uh, saying how much uh, I appreciate uh, what you did today. Information was, uh, was really great. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us today. Um, any, any final thoughts you have for us today, Cassie, before we sign off? No, I, I'm sorry my internet's being a pain today, but uh, no, I mean, I think it's a really exciting time. The, the future is definitely changing for ag, and I think that's for the better. There's a lot of technology we can start using in things, and um, substrate's really going to be a, you know, a, a, I think moving forward, you're going to see a lot more about it, and I'm excited to see where it all goes. 
Yeah, and I sure hope, you know, we, we really did touch on just the basics or the beginner side today. I hope you'll come back in a little while and, and kind of take us to step two. Uh, the other thing I'd love to do someday is I'd like to get together with you and uh, some of your fellow uh, Cal Poly grads and, uh, and talk about uh, your experiences in irrigation and opportunities. Uh, I think that'd be really beneficial to our viewers. So hopefully you'll come back and do that with us as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Well, listen, thank you again. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we will uh, uh, hopefully catch uh, most of you on Friday. We've got a grower, uh, Jim Klein, who is using our water management services. Uh, he grows about 20,000 acres or manages about 20,000 acres in California. And he's going to be talking about that on uh, Friday. So it should be very interesting. So again, Cassie, thank you. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll catch you back here Friday. Bye.